everybody. How's it going? Dan Schindler here on Drum Talk TV broadcasting from Globe, Arizona. I know. Where's that? It's 100 miles east of Phoenix up in the mountains. And my guest today is Tommy Igo coming to us from near San Francisco in Northern California. How are you, Tommy? Hey, man. How are you doing? Good to see you. I'm doing great. Good. Me too. It's wonderful to finally have you on. So much to talk about. Folks, tell us where you're watching from. And if you're familiar with the program, you know that from time to time I'll be looking over here at the hockey game. I mean, at your comments. And if you have any <laughs> questions, let us know and I'll relay the questions to Tommy. This is <laughs> Tommy, there's so much to talk to you about. I think what I want to start with is that um, Groove Essentials with Hudson Music uh, the first iteration is 15 year old, 15 years old. The second is 10 years old. How fast does time fly? Uh, it feels like yesterday uh, we signed off on the final edit. You know, it's. Yeah. Uh, but if anybody's listening to this and they're you know kids or whatever like that, uh, it does go by in a blink. It it's, does. Uh, I, I get emails all the time from people saying like, "I grew up. I grew up." Uh, learning how to play with you, and I, I, I just don't feel like that's possible. Right, that's hilarious. <laughs> I wrote this yesterday. I feel like, oh, I wrote, just finished this yesterday. Right, <laughs> right. Give everyone, uh, what's the overview of Groove Essentials? I mean, the title is obvious, but I still think it warrants some, you know, facilitation. Well, you know, um, so I have been writing. I, I did a product product with uh, Hudson. Um, uh, called Getting Started on Drums. That was the very first video I ever did. It was 2001. And uh, it was uh, uh, very well received. It was number one in its, in its category. And it was me taking a box of drums, uh, a, a, dr <laughs> a box of drums, taking them out and setting them up on camera. And, um, I remember that. Yeah, it was, and it was because um, I think Guitar Center, some of the, uh, you know, some of the other retailers at the time, um, they were getting a lot of returns. And it was also because at that particular time, a lot of the cheap drum sets were coming from, uh, you know, China, whatever, stuff like that. And they were coming uh, pancaked, in a birthday cake in a box, right? So the right. whole thing, the whole drum set came in one box, the whole thing, yeah. right? Rims weren't on, the broads weren't on, nothing was on. It was just, it was just <laughs> crap, crap in a box, right? <laughs> and, you know, you know, mommy, mommy and daddy or lawyer and doctor or whatever they do, you know, they, they open this. They're like, what the hell? I don't have anything in it. And it's like, you know, there's a picture of a guy like holding a drum set, but that doesn't look anything like this. Right. So uh, we took it. We literally did a uh, and this was all brandless. We weren't working with a brand. It was just a generic how to take it out of the box and make it look like a drum set. Yeah. All right. And uh, very well, some we sense of ergonomics, right? Yes, right. It's just like it, your brand may look a little different. Yeah. Your brand may look a little bit more like this, or might look a little bit like this. It didn't matter. Yeah. Because you know, people are people are pretty intelligent. They can look at this and they can kind of go, oh, oh, I get it, you know, and then figure it out. But that there's no real instruction. You know, it's like you know, imagine like taking an alto sax out, and the whole thing is disassembled. Right, the valves in the pack. Well, I mean, I, my kid plays sax, so I like when I got his first alto. He got his alto, right? And and I was really excited because you know, I'm like, I, you know, I play all these instruments, and I'm a musician, I'm well trained, and blah blah blah. And I get this crap, right? And I'm just like, what the hell? I had no idea what was going on. So I went on YouTube and got like the first lesson and stuff like that. And this is, you know, uh, and you could do that now, you know, yeah. but you couldn't do it then, you know. Right. So it's, it isn't like, you know, people forget you just couldn't go on a, on, on, a, on a web browser and just say, how do I set up my drum set? Bam, and there's a video. <laughs> right. You can do that now, you know. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, that was the first one. So getting back to your thing of uh, Groove Essentials, um, I started working on my next book, and it was going to be in a slightly Groove Encyclopedia. Uh, but it wasn't going to be like, you know, every single groove from every single place. It was going to be the core, and it was uh, the core got to knows, and it was going to be um, stylist. It wasn't going to be uh, uh, about the grooves of today. It was. I wanted to write something that would kind of be the Chapin book moving forward for the next 100 years. And that, and by and I know that's, a, that's you know, a very, very lofty goal. <laughs> but the idea was to not write something that was dependent upon the music or the style that was happening right now. So when you play like boom, got boom, that you know, what do you not get? The boom or the smack? Right. It has nothing to do.
at all with the era that you're playing with. So core philosophies brought to fundamentals. And we brought, and, and I started writing this book, and I was like, I was really getting, man, I was really feeling good about it. And, I, and the Rick Trump calls from, uh, he was the president of Vic Firth at the time. And uh, he says, you know, we've had just this amazing response to the rudimental poster that, you know, we put out. And we want to do one for grooves. I'm not kidding. This came out like, like I was pretty much close, close to finish with the book. And, um, and he says, we're going to do one grooves. And he says, we're thinking about calling it essential grooves. And I said, that's the weirdest frigging thing I've ever heard. I'm writing groove essentials right now. That's he crazy. Went, he went, we're done. Yeah. That's it. We're done. So we, he said, let's do the poster. And we did the poster. So the poster came out 2000. Three, maybe two, three, or something like that. I guess it's three, and it blew up. Every band room in the world had the poster. Funny story, funny story. My wife, who is a high school administrator, I met right. Yeah, and um, we're we're dating, right? Going out, and. <laughs> She goes into the band room of uh, into the band room of her school. She's an administrator. She, and she's just gonna. She went, "Holy freaking hell!" <laughs> I was on the wall. I was on the wall of her bed, and she was just like, "What's this? You didn't tell me about this." I'm like, "That's what? hilarious." Yeah, I was like she had no. Idea. It was just funny that she walked in. And she was like, "What are you doing on the wall?" You know? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, yeah, no. we got married. So what the heck? It kind That's of great. Uh, Did you uh, end up anyway. giving her her own poster? Yes, I did. She you should do that like that. every anniversary. A every, new every, absolutely. And say, here, here you go, honey. Here's a new one. This one's signed. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, really, and they, we, they gave them away. They, they're, that's the whole idea with the posters, that they give them to the educators, they put them up on the wall, and the people were just like, I want that. And then they made another 50000 Before we knew it, we were up to 250000 we're a half million now, and it might be even more. Jesus, I don't even know. Um, and then um, we made the DVD. We did a four-day shoot, uh, which is really funny because nobody does this anymore. This is when before piracy and YouTube and all that stuff. People, uh, producers invested large <laughs> loads of money. money in production. All right, production. Yeah, yeah we went to uh, Bear Tracks. We up in Woodstock. We were like uh, the freaking camera guys were NFL, you know, guys. They're like. Just like really great, great quality, and we did a four day shoot uh, up there, and it went great. And uh, the book, so that came out. That was really, really well received. That went to number one, and then next year after that came the book. That's the play along. Oh. That's, that's the crown jewel, and the whole thing is the play along tracks. So, right. Yeah, that were expanded after there. That's cool. Yeah, that's the story. I got going. And. Tommy and I will will do another show with Rob Wallace to give yes. you more info, but we want to just throw something out there right now. We're putting together a contest, a uh, contest slash competition, where it's going to be based on Groove Essentials tracks and lessons where you'll be able to reproduce something, and then we'll get Tommy, we'll get some other judges as well, and we're going to come up with some really cool prizes and giveaways and things like That's that. That's going to be great. And, yeah, and we're still working on the time frame. So watch for that. It'll be Tommy, Rob, Wallace, and myself. And we'll, yep. we'll bust that out probably within a month, I think. We'll be able to yeah. let the cat so, out of the bag. Yeah. Let's, thank good. you for all that. That's really cool. Let's switch gears. Something I've always wanted to ask you is, you know, you had this opportunity to be the drummer and the conductor of Disney's Lion King production mm -hmm. my first question is what is it through the decades that has made drummers great band leaders and conductors and then tell us how that gig came about and what the gig entails in your position uh wow okay so uh you know it's funny drummers i do believe are really really good uh music directors mm -hmm. Um, if they're trained and have the right mindset, right? Really, 
they, they, you know, they can't just be a drummer. They really do need to be musicians. Absolutely. And they, those are two separate things. They really, really are. Yeah. And um, they should be one, but they are often separate. Um, and if you think like a musician and you, but drummers, good ones, really good drummers, they, they understand what's going, they hear everything. Yeah, really good drummers hear the entire concept because our beat is the backbone of everything that everything everything happens. The drums, it starts there, foundation, spine, whatever you want to call it, that's where it starts, and everything all the way up to the lyric. Yeah, all the way ramp, you know, go up the ladder all the way to the top to the singer at the top of the lyric. Drummers really do understand what's happening within the entire ensemble. It's interesting that so many great arrangers in the world are trombone players oh it's very very interesting there have been so many interesting trauma like it's really funny how many great in my band and san francisco three of the four are trombone players wow you know yeah it's crazy and i and i was talking to this like why and you go through this you go through the years there's so many great arrangers are trombone players and they and i was like what is it with you guys it's you gotta know? be the slide Matt, nah, you know you think about it right is that you know they sit a lot of times the trombones sit in the center of the orchestra right. and they hear everything they hear it's just you know we and they gravitate towards the end trombones that it's you know it's funny how like different personalities gravitate to different instruments and stuff yeah and like trombone players are just you know they're those people they they hear yeah and they hear and they, and then when they write they, there's like a, i can feel like they man they've really been listening to all this input you know, it's funny. It's really funny. The psychological, um, uh, the psychological uh, uh, consistency when, that you will see you know, when, in, when uh, you, in instruments. Yeah. And when you look at those two things you just pointed out, the drummer being the foundation, the spine, whatever, and everything is, you know, up from there. And the trombone players typically sitting in the middle of the band or the orchestra. Mm -hmm. Because of those two things, those two musicians really view of the music they're able to be most aware of everything because of their role and even like you said the position physically where they are within the organism that's making all that music 100 it's and it's it's a mindset you know i've always been very inquisitive uh i was always up in everybody's grill about like what are you what's that what are you doing like what is that like learning about like you know like how does that guitar part work you know or how does that like what is going on in the saxes what is that you know, like, like, show, can I see that? Show me that bar on your thing. What is that? You know, and like, I was, I was that guy. I was That's just cool. constantly like asking, like, what is that? Like, you know, and uh, you know that I found out that that's that's one of the reasons I'm a good conductor and stuff. And but I never wanted to be a conductor for my living at all. I enjoyed conducting. I, it was, uh, you know, my my job at Disney was being the uh, principal principal drummer in the center, but then. Um, I, w I was like, wow, if I conduct this thing, I'm really going to be like super happy because I'll have all this different stuff going on. And I'm that kind of guy that gets bored easily. So I don't uh, like, and I never got bored of Lion King because I had different responsibilities. Yeah, that's, that's no. really cool. And how did the gig come about? Uh, the gig came about like every other gig comes about. Yeah, it got recommended. Yeah. Oh, that's, and you were prepared for it. I was prepared times 10. Man, I was like, man, I, you know, at that point in my career, that was 1997, and um, I was, you know, one of the guys in New York. Um, I was subbing on four Broadway shows at the time. You know, I was always a chameleon. I, I mean, I was doing a bunch of studio work. You know, I had that over there. I was doing a whole bunch of really, really great education stuff. Um, uh, you know, Groove Essentials had already come out at that time. Uh, 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 and the group essentials I was in my head, but I was doing a lot of stuff with really great educators and we were writing things for drum lines and all these different things that really, really, I was like, everything was happening for me. Everything was great. And I was getting offered all these Broadway shows. You want to do this one, you do this one. And then this MD, his name is George Church, great guy. And um, he got the Lion King gig. So this is how it works on Broadway, basically. Um, the MD uh, gets the gig. Like he's like the producers, the name, they hire who they want, they hire the choreographer, they hire the thing. Who's going to be our music director? Boom, get the people that you want. Then he calls who he wants. 
So you're always one degree away from where you want to be. You're, you know, like if you want to work off Broadway, you know, like uh, people are constantly asking me, like, how do I get onto Broadway? I don't like work off Broadway first. Stop aiming for Broadway. Stop right. it. Start aiming for off Broadway. Stop aiming for Park Avenue. Don't it's just start. like drumming. You don't start out playing real fast. You got to get it down at one speed. Yeah, you don't want that step. Yeah. Man, you do not want to play on Broadway and blow it. That's yeah. not, you want to blow it off wrong. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, yeah, get your no, but you start at anything. You're good. The first time you do this, if you there's there's a huge gap between people. Well, you know, things are changing now with Broadway, and things have been changing since Lion King. Lion King kind of kicked off um, Broadway from being very, very traditional and kind of corny. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I am not a I am not a Broadway guy at all. And uh, and I, in fact, when I got offered Lion King, I said no. Which would have been a tragically stupid mistake, uh, as it turned out. But no one knew what Lion King was going to be. Right. But I was, you know, I was just that typical young guy in New York. I was like, I had the, I was just like, you know, walking down. I had two cell phones, you know, like I was like that guy. <laughs> and um, and uh, I just was like, I don't want to be tied down to a show because you wouldn't get a show. It's a job, yeah. yeah. It's a commitment for you if that you can. But then you get the job and. If you get the job and it's a success, success, you can sub it out and do a bunch of other things, which is eventually what happened with me. But you have to really um, understand that Lion King is a once in a generation event, and it's a once it will outlive us all. Chances are, if you're hearing this interview, the Lion King is running on Broadway. You may be on your last gasp. But Lion King is still living. Yeah. It's one of the. It's a. It's a juggernaut. It's a. It's a. It's a something that became bigger than, than anything anybody could believe, and no one knew. No one knew. You know, it was a leap of faith of mine to take the job in the first place. So the reason I took the job. Let's go back to your original things. Like, like, how'd you get the guy? Well, I got the job because the guy who got the MD, he called me. I said no, and he said why, and I said, ew. <laughs> well, I, I, I said Lion King they're going to be running around in animal costumes and Disney and what the F no and he goes and I swear to God this is what he said he said okay he said but you should maybe reconsider there's this crazy lady and by crazy he meant great you know, um, named Julie Taymor who is not into Broadway and wants to do something completely different, including the music. And you'll have full autonomy over writing the drum book. Ooh. And I went, I said, hmm. I said, you're not just, I said, you're not messing with me, are you? And he goes, no. I said, he says, no. And I said, and this is the last thing I said, okay, uh, what's the commitment? And he said, nine weeks. And I said, and now this was at the time, everybody does this now. A lot of people didn't do it then. They were going to take the show out to put it up on its feet in a city outside of New York. Right. So they take it. So the show can suck, and no one knows while they figure it out. Yeah. Because a high production show has to do a has a lot of trial and error. They have to fix stuff. They have to, it's it's hard, really really hard, and it's usually really really bad in the beginning. So they yeah, take it out. It's like beta it's testing at the Hundred percent. They got it. Market. Yeah. Right. And they can get all the kinks out, and they can suck outside of New York. And then bring it back to New York, all polished and happy and shiny, yeah. right? So I said, where's the, where, I said, nine weeks. I said, where? And he said, Minneapolis. I said, I'm in. Because Minneapolis is a great music town. And Prince was there at the time. He had his club. And it was killing for nine weeks. Wow. In Minneapolis. I mean, oh, it was so great. It was so, so, so great. It was absolutely great. And that, I didn't even tell you the story about the Lion King in there, which is hell of a story for nine weeks there, but what I, what I witnessed and saw as the Lion King became uh, like, uh, actually like, like really, really bad into really, really incredible. That was an incredible metamorphosis. But then, uh, so I said yes, I got the show, and um, we opened on Broadway in November. That was uh, August, and then we, I think so, right? August? Yeah, August to November, I think, yeah. And how long did the first run go until you started to realize, hey, this has really grown some legs, man? Um, it, it took, listen, I'm not, even gonna, I'm not even gonna lie, all right? This is how it went. This is how it went. 
We're in, we're in Minneapolis, okay? Now, the first four weeks in Minneapolis was no audience. We were rehearsing. And stops and starts. Da, da, da. We still haven't been, we really haven't even gone through the show yet, like a whole run through, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and we can't see what the hell's going on up there. I mean, and, but I would do tech rehearsals where I would go in and I would see the tech, you know, and uh, at night without music. So they would just be working on the production and the lights and the uh, hydraulics and the uh, people flying and whatever the hell it was. And I remember I walked in and I just, I took a look. I was just, you know, quietly went in and had my little badge so I can get in. And, and I sat down and they were working the, the uh, stampede scene. And I just looked at it and I went, we're so screwed. Oh, wow. are, I said, I, it looked like, it looked like a junior high production. Oh, wow. And I just was looking at it. And I went, I was like, oh my God. And I didn't, and I was just like, I didn't say anything. I was just like, wow. And I, and I didn't, but what happened? This is Julie Taymor, right? And that's because they were working with all these technologies that had not existed yet. Mm -hmm. Some of the percent they needed lights and it was all this diffusion and all this stuff and none of it was there and none of it was working so it was incredible to watch so by the and then and you know then i went into well i saw it later i'll tell you that later but so i go back so we but week five we now have our first audience okay and all the disney big guys are there the whole michael eisner the whole sea level Wait, that was the first there audience. everybody's there and i'm like i'm, I'm we're all like wow i said I was like, they really give a shit about this, man. And they're all here. This is like not a joke. They're not outsourcing this, right? Yeah. And these guys were great. I talked to all these guys. These were, these were amazing. These were really, really cool. Um, uh, Michael Schumacher and all these guys. They were, uh, they were, uh, Tom Schumacher, they were incredible. Um, really, really good guys. And um, we start to the show. They come, first they come out and they say, okay, you're the first people to see this. We may stop. And he says, we're, we have to keep the actors safe. We have a lot of very important stuff that's going on up here, which is really code for saying someone could die if they don't do it right. Yeah. Okay. So they and he said, we can stop. Right. And we are, I'm like, they're like, I'm really, yeah, okay. yeah. They're, like, like, they're like, you know, they're calling. They're like, uh, yeah, I'll be back soon. I need another job, you know? <laughs> and so anyway, we start the show and it's, it's the animals come. Did you ever see, did you see Lion King? I haven't seen it. Okay. So it's 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 amazing. So they did Julie's incredible. So um we start the show, right? And it's Circle of Life, the famous uh, circle of life, you know. Uh and the, the like you know I know the movie, of course. Right, the whole play, yeah, well think about that. Okay, fine. The only animals come in from all angles, right? The animals are coming down the aisles of the this is the very first freaking thing. They're coming down the aisles of the of the place. And they're all and people are looking and now I can see the first couple of rows from the drums like um, in the pit. I can see and people are like this and they're like looking around, they're like all right. and then at the end so the it, it goes goes boom like that that's the last note of the first thing. And people I'm like Oh wow they're weeping. They're weeping they're doing the same shit we had done for four weeks, but and, you get a response. Never, and, and now I'm going to the summary statement of this entire story, Dan. You never know until they tell you. You don't yeah. like writing a book. Like I wrote Groove Essentials. I said, I think this is good, but I don't get to decide. They do. Right. No one decides but the people at the end of the chain. And when we saw, we were looking around, people were weeping. They were just like green. People are freaking out. Like, who are they? And I'll figure the flute player turned around to me. He was also from New York because he had to play 16 different wood flutes. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he turned around and he looked at me and he went, cha ching. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> that was all he said. He was like a New York guy. It was so great. What cha ching. <laughs> what a great said, yeah, story. Yeah, it was like, we had no idea. And then it just became this phenomenon. Then we brought it to New York and the reviews were out of control and, yeah. you know, and, and everything. And it just became, you know, it's just once, in, it's a once in a generation event, you know. Yeah. Awesome. Let's look at comments. Thank you for sharing that story, Tommy. Let's see who's on board. Hey, Luis is in Amsterdam. Mike Skinner in South Wales. He says, always love the background knowledge that Tommy and enthuses about the whole musical content and not just focus on his own instrument. The song is made up of the whole sound coming together in symphony with each other. Thanks, Mike. And we've also got... Uh, William Powery in Scotland. He says, I'm a huge fan. 
Uh, so great to see him here. Thanks, Dan and Tommy. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. New York City, Seth Cashman. Uh, anyone have any questions? Hey, Gary Benson. Akra Das, what's going on? Akra Das says, yay. I'm on day 19 of the <laughs> Iowa <laughs> Challenge. Uh, loving getting the face into the program. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, what is drums your first instrument? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. And then what did you learn and how did you progress to the point where you can work off of a score of music? Because not even all musicians that play melodic instruments can do that. Um, you know, reading is reading. And uh, when, you, when you look at a score, you're looking for, uh, uh, there's always a chain of events that are happening. Where's the, where's the melody? The first thing is, where's the melody? Right. You know? So you remember when you were talking before about um, what makes what makes what makes drummers such good music directors? You know, where everybody who gets up in front of a band and starts sing, and they're in charge. Everyone, whether they're they're whether they're aware of it or whether they're not aware of it, is running down a constant checklist in their head of what's important to them. Drummers immediately go to feel groove subconsciously it's just you can't we can't avoid it it's the first thing we think about mm -hmm. groove feel what's the most important thing to anyone who's listening groove and feel yeah anyone you, you, you the string player they'll immediately go to intonation they'll immediately go to at, who's out of tune who's right who's wrong it's like it's and it's yeah. it, and that's I will deal with that too, but it's not number one. Right. So like, and it's priorities, your musical priorities when you, so this whole thing of like it, yes, of course it is a simultaneous delivery of music and things do need to be in tune and things new do need to be phrased the right way. But if you deal with that first before the groove is there, you're wasting your time. Yeah. That makes everything is, sense. everything, everything comes from time and groove first. Now that's of course speaking from a non symphonic spot, the point of view. All right. I deal with mostly, you know, music that's in tempo and I'm not interested in, in, uh, you know, conducting cults or anything, you know, so it's like, it's not, that's not my thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, you know, uh, so for, for popular music that has like a groove and stuff like to it and time, that's one of the reasons why I think rhythm, not just drummers, but rhythm section people in general, like bass players are also really, you know, very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, and it isn't to generalize, like, you know, to say, like, a horn player can't think about groove of time. That's not what I'm saying at all. Right. But I am saying that our instruments make us who we are. Right. Our main instruments, that's our DNA. It's in us. So don't, don't fight it. It's part of it. We all bring to the table beautiful things. Yeah. All of us bring to the table what we bring to the table. And one of the things I bring to the table is a groove-focused, groove-first focus. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. And yeah. what, so let's start with drums. When did you start playing and what did you see or hear that made you say it's got to be drums? Well, my dad was a drummer and he was a, a very famous drummer from uh, the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, etc. And then he became a very uh, popular teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, drums were always in the house. And, um, and and I just came out into the world hitting shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, and, uh, you know, there were marks on everything and like, you know, I used to beat the crap out of stuff and pull pots. And my, my dad said, he's got it. Yeah. You know, he just knew it's like, you could not keep me away from the drums. You couldn't. And I mean, he even like, I couldn't reach the pedals. I was two, right. Or three or whatever. You know, and I couldn't reach the pedal, so I'd stand behind, like every kid does, they stand behind the thing, and they go, like, and he's just like, I, and he goes, and he does something so beautiful. He goes, and he spends money to convert, like, a floor tom to a bass drum, and he builds a tiny set for me that I can reach, right? Yeah. He brings it home, he's like, here it is. And I just say, uh-uh, you play that one, I'm going to play the big one. <laughs> <laughs> He said, I spent all this money on converting a bass drum, putting a bass drum on it. He said, no way. He said, I said, you play that one. I'll play the big one. I didn't that's care. Hilarious. Yeah, but this, you know, that's what happened. It was like, it was in my house. I was always in, I was always, um, I was always interested in a lot more than the drums. Always. Yeah. Um, well, the drums have never been enough for me. 
I, I'm too, uh, I, I'm, I'm more than just one instrument. I, I need the piano. I need the orchestra. I need the whole thing. Yeah. So uh, at a pretty early age, I started studying piano mm -hmm. at the same time. And uh, that has made me the drummer I am today. That's piano. great to hear. Piano is maybe, yeah, piano is maybe the drummer I am today. Yeah. With drums, did you gravitate towards jazz first? Say that again? With drums, did you gravitate towards jazz first? Yes, I did, because my dad was a jazz drummer. Yeah. And um, yeah, I had a reverse beginning than most people. Most 99% mm -hmm. um, of people played straight eighth note music first, rock and roll and stuff, and they played some, some variant of, of boom smack, right? And um, I grew up with ding, ding, a ding. Yeah, and I grew up traditional. I grew, you know, so I mean, when I did drum corps, I did uh, drum corps to get my match grip together, which is usually the opposite of what yeah, you know, a lot of yeah. people are doing. You know, I've so I've seen you do some things um, that fascinate me because my weakest link in my playing is something I was never taught and something I never made the time to make an effort at, which I really want to do someday, and that is anything Latin related. Any Latin beats just fascinate me, and I just think they're so cool. And I, I play some music that I guess some people might consider somewhat complicated, long epic pieces by Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Yes, Genesis, stuff like that. But I see probably the most simple Latin beats, and it just twists my brain like, wow, how are they freaking doing that? Because <laughs> I never visited that. I never had the training. Right, exactly. That stuff, it's, it's about exposure. Yeah, first you got to be exposed to it, right. and you know there's there's a phenomenon right now. It's always been well, it's bad right now, really bad. Um, where you know some students of mine, they're like, I want to learn to play jazz. Oh, I got I got to do this. I got to learn to play jazz. Do they know what they're asking when they no, ask that? They don't know. It's just they read it somewhere, and they said, I got to do this too. Yeah. All right. And it's just a four letter word, J A Z Z. And, and it's the don't... only it's the only genre with the word daddio attached to it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and he said and he's and I, I'm like, all right, okay, well what are you listening to? And they're like, Well, I'm not. And then then I can't help you. Right. If you don't listen to the music, you know, so the reason Latin music, uh, Latin grooves, Latin music mysterious, scary. And also just, you know, like, wow, like Mount Everest is because you nobody people are not serious about listening to the music first. Right. You gotta immerse to a degree. You gotta complete you, you gotta listen. Don't yeah. worry about playing it yet. Yeah. Listen. Listen. Well, just don't, worry, don't even think, don't even talk to you about playing. Just yeah. listen to the music. And then what starts to happen is that just through the uh, just through the uh, just through the act of listening, the act of listening is not nearly discussed enough educationally. The act of listening is something all great players know and is universally needed for anyone to achieve greatness on an instrument or even in life, I say. But right. listening, like truly listening, is one of the first and most important things I teach my students when they walk in this room. I love that because I'm, I'm a big listener, but I need to – well, this is where this question comes in. Can you please give us your top – three to five old school traditional Latin music recommendations for someone who wants to start to immerse themselves. Well, if you want to go, if, if you want to just listen to um, uh, Latin music, that was just going to be like, like straight up, like the real deal killing, just listen to Tito Puente. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, just listen and, and just get that. Just, 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 just do that. Just do that. You know, and then for the guys who are interested in like getting into some like, because you know most drummers like me and any, you know, we play Latin Latin jazz. Yeah, we we don't play. Listen, there's no drum set in authentic Latin music. Right, there is none. Right, right. there's only percussion. Almost yeah. all of the world section. When you look at the world section of Groove Essentials, I go out of my way to scream from the top of my lungs that there is no drum set. Yeah. There is there are percussion parts in the we're talking about grooves that have um, uh, uh, social ramifications, political meaning. They have they have yeah. culture, food. It's part of the culture. Right. You're not just learning a beat. You know, you listen to uh, El Negro talk about music. You know, yeah. he talks about Cuba and all that. And um, 
you know, I'm a, I'm a white guy from Jersey, you know, and it's very important that I respect the music that I'm talking about by telling everyone that I study it and I know it, but I'm not from it. It's a yeah. difference. Right? Yes, absolutely. and I get my source. Where I get my inspiration is from the source, from the place, the, the sources. Let's go. Let's come on. Let's, let's let's be real about this. You know, that's why I put listening lists, and nobody reads them. Oh, I put wow. listening lists in Groove Essentials. It's all right there. Groove Essentials has listening lists, has artists written right there for you, and people come up to me all the time. It's like I don't know who to listen to. I'm like, do you have Groove Essentials? They go, yeah. I'm like, yes, you do. You do know who to listen to. <laughs> How are they not seeing it? It's just it says listening list. <laughs> listening is a well, maybe. Maybe you need to be more clear. <laughs> <laughs> and so let's go back it's to like, it's like like next steps. It's like like next steps. Who do I listen to? Right. You know, and it's like well, <laughs> let's let's go to that four letter word jazz because jazz even more so than saying rock. There's such a wide spectrum, so I think that 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 word, that genre, and someone saying I want to learn to play jazz begs the question: What is jazz to you? Because to some, it might be um, anybody from Louis Armstrong. It might be Josephine Baker. It might be Return to Forever, Mahi Vushnorka. What is jazz? Duke Ellington was the one who said, you know, he's a gene. He hated categories. Yeah. And he said, there's only two kinds of music, good and bad. And you that's know? subjective. So that even makes that's it more what he fun. meant. He meant it's good and bad to the person who's listening to it. Yeah. You know, and so he didn't like, he didn't want to be pigeonholed as just one thing, you know, right. and he very famously said that. So, uh, the, um, so when we look at terms of category, we're looking at umbrellas, macro umbrellas, okay, big yeah. tents, okay, and and underneath those macro big tents, you could put your micro uh, uh, categories, you know, like uh, uh, I mean, for example, I mean, there was like neo jazz soul. I'm like, what the hell is that? You know, it's like it's, it's, I guess it's that. You know, I don't know. This is like you know the terms of what people call things has always been a bone of contention. You know, even yeah. when you were like, back before there was Napster and then Spotify and then iTunes and the whole world blew up, there was a thing called a Tower Music and Sam Goody and where people yeah. would go buy records and you know. Licorice pizza. pizza. Right, and everybody was fighting against the categories then. This isn't a new yeah. battle at all. It's like, it's like, well, what do I call it? I said, that's been the bone of the problem with all of my bands my whole life. Nobody knows what to call what the music right. I play. I because really... I don't play. I play music. I don't play jazz. Right, right. I, when people come to see my band, they're going. I, I will source music from anybody, anywhere. I don't have an allegiance to anything. Yeah, that's all I care about. And if I if it's good, I'll play it. And I'm, it's, and I right, good. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm curious if you experience this, and this question is for you listeners too. And I'll look at more comments in a moment. Um, I, I think I'm a few years older than you, and because of my age and because of where I grew up, I ha as a very young musician at seven years old, I started playing, and I had the fortunate environment of back then music. So that was 1969, 70. I started playing, and back then music was much less segregated by category on the radio. So mm -hmm. I would put on the local LA station on my headphones, which was 93KHJ. <laughs> so remember that. And I grew up in the San Fernando Valley part of LA. And I would hear Neil Diamond. Then I would hear Steppenwolf. Then I would hear The Who. Then I would hear Liza you Minnelli. Hear then, nothing like that anymore. Nothing. Yeah, right. Nothing. It was all, and, the, and then you'd hear Sly and the Family Stone, you'd hear yeah. all these different things. You heard music, right. And that's all I knew. All I knew is I was playing the music. I didn't know that some of it was soul, black influenced, or, or any of that. I just played to whatever came on and tried to not just play the math, which is a sore spot for me. You know, when, you know, when you go into a pub or a bar, and a band plays four songs in a row, Aerosmith, ACDC, Bad Company, and Peter Frampton, but it all sounds the same because it sounds like that band. They might be putting the beats and the stuff in the right place, but they don't have that guitar sound. They don't have the nuances of each musician, 
that they're emulating at a very young age, listening to all these different types of music and not really realizing it, I kind of noticed that, okay, so this guy's doing ghost notes and roughs more than this guy's just doing the, you know, and I think that's so important. You, it goes back to what you're saying about the importance of listening. I look at it as anyone who speaks any language can learn another language, but until you truly speak the dialect and hide your own accent, you're not really speaking that language properly. And music if anything, is just as much the same way. It's learning those little nuances that make the difference, I think. Right. Well, I think if you want to go deep into a style, you got to go yeah. deep, you know? Yeah. And I think people, I think also, uh, Dan, that some people hear those nuances and some don't. Some people don't hear nuance. People hear, a lot of people hear uh, hear this. Yeah, they, and the surface. they like this. They go like that. It's like this. It's, you know, a lot of people who, you know, hear Buddy Rich, for example, they they can't they hear a barrage of stuff. It's coming at you like this and it comes at them like that. It looks like this. Right. Yeah. And then and then but people who can hear that, who can appreciate that, it comes at them like that. Yeah. They can hear that goes. It, there's all these different nuances in between these things. So with, so some people just don't hear nuance. And I'm telling you, as a guy who has worked with thousands of people behind his damn instrument, that is a thing. Yeah. They have to be taught nuance. They don't understand the depth of this. And then once you start to expose what it is, you start to open their ears and they start to get it. Now, some people are naturally like that. They can hear that. Right. I was like that. I can hear everything. I, I have... I have ears like a freaking bat. I can hear everything, yeah. you know, and it's goes and I go deep inside tracks. But a lot of people, that's what I remember. I talked to you about listening. Yeah. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah. And that this can be it. taught. Can, can someone be trained to listen for the nuances? Can not be them? taught to have the same ears that I have, but that's right. not what we're trying to do. Right. Right. What we're trying to do is improve our listening focus. So if you're listening to, so this is all about dialing your ears in and getting focus. That's all it is. So if we look at it, so can you teach somebody to have great ears? I'm going to reframe that question to say, can I hit, teach somebody to listen better? And okay. that I can do. Okay. How good they get, how deep we go, and how much calories we put into this will be a discussion that we'll have as we go down the road. But it all starts with the first thing, and that's just opening the idea of what listening actually is. Right. Awesome. Thank you for that. Let's look at comments again, see if we have questions. Oh, there's all kinds of stuff here. Uh, let me scroll down. We've got – let me catch up to where we left off. Bear with me, folks. This is my first time doing this today. <laughs> How's that hockey game? This is the, that's a hockey game he's got over there. Don't even, don't even try it. <laughs> What's the score, Dan? It's 3-1 Red Wings. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy just put a gnarly check on the wingman. <laughs> three. three. <laughs> uh, here's a question from Javier Manzano. It says, Tommy, how did it feel to play? Oh, this is a great question. How did it feel to play on the Buddy Rich tributes? Uh, did you improvise a lot when on stage performing? Um, and I'll add to that, how much did you immerse yourself in those pieces to learn what Betty Rich was doing versus what Javier is asking, free-forming in your own way in the structure of his pieces? Uh, well, I grew up on a steady diet of Buddy. Uh, so I... Uh, I know those records backwards and forwards. Oh, um, I thought you meant your dad was yelling at you all the time. Oh, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, folks. Kathy, I'm just kidding. Come on. No, I was like, I, uh, I played a, um, uh, I knew all those things backwards and forwards. And, um, but, uh, you know, uh, Buddy was a, uh, you know, I have an insight into Buddy that most drummers don't have. I, my dad was very close, was very close to Buddy. And um, I grew up knowing Buddy. I used to be, that. I, I, I have a splash over here that he gave to me. And I have a, uh, I mean, I grew up around him. And I saw him not too long before he passed, actually. We sat on his bus. He was in his bathrobe after the show. We were oh, taking, wow. and talking about, yeah, it's, and he's always been just, he was, you know, I was always just a very respectful kid, you know, uh, in front of him and obviously and uh i think he felt that and he was nothing but amazing to me and, you know all the, the entire time so when kathy called me to do the buddy thing i was for number one honored um and number two um very very cognizant of 
the one thing that Buddy hated among more than anything else, and that is trying to be him. Buddy hated copiers. He hated them. He, yeah. he despised people who copy. And if you played his licks in front of him, he, he was, don't, don't, just don't. And, and he respected people who had an original voice That's nice. and, and had their, and, and did their own thing. He was like, he couldn't stand guys who were trying to do him, but not him, you know? Yeah. Uh, so the last thing I wanted to do was go up there and play Buddy's stuff. Now there's a couple of like, no, I did uh, Willow Crest and Preach and Teach, and these are all famous Buddy tunes and stuff. Yeah. Um, and the one thing that I was never going to do is play any of Buddy's classic licks. You know, there was just no way I was going to do that. I know that vocabulary, I can, but that would be literally missing the point of playing Buddy's music. You know, um, you know, I wanted to play something that Buddy would Buddy would approve of. That's what I wanted to say. You know, if I was thinking about playing anything, I'd play. I want to play something that Buddy would approve of. And wouldn't yell at me for after. <laughs> I go and say, "What the hell are you doing?" I go, "What's wrong with you?" <laughs> what are you thinking? That's hilarious. <laughs> no, but uh, it was that was basically so. There was a lot of improvisation, but I grew up on those charts, and uh, it was like you know, it's like breathing for me. Cool. Yeah. Here's a couple other cool questions. Here's here's a comment. I gotta read this comment from our buddy Casey Grillo of. Uh, Queens, right? Hey, Casey, how are you? You got to come on the show. Let's do this again. He says, uh, I still hear really good after all these years. I can't say that. Um, so Akratas says, what new music did you listen to in 2020 so far? Do you listen to much new music, Tommy? You know, 2020 has been one of those, uh, uh, for number one, yes. Um, okay. Uh, you know, 2020 has been very strange. Um, I think for all of us and, um, I, you know, we're 20 days away from the election. The pandemic is happening. Uh, there's more stress than I can really remember ever. Like, you know, just yeah. like, like it's just in this country and this, especially people are dying and, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, my, like I said, my wife's in a high school administrator and, can't even imagine what she's going through um, with all the stuff. Uh, so it's just a lot of stress right now. And I don't find my, I, I, you know, I'm old enough to know when my brain is at, at, when my brain is at that point where, man, I'm thirsty for some new stuff. Yeah. What I've been doing, 2020 has been all about me. And I haven't shown anybody this yet, but writing. I've been writing and creating nice. and like in my studio. And I'm waiting for a vaccine to get out so that we can get sort of like back to gigging. So this is the longest I've ever, this is because this question is actually really interesting. This is the longest I, and I'm sure many of my fellow professionals have ever gone without playing with other musicians and playing gigs. Yeah. And it is, I find, I have found that my thirst for listening to new music is dependent upon me playing music at all interesting and i am uh i'm like at that point right now where i am really waiting for 2020 to like say goodbye to 2020 right we got like i said 20 days before the election and then and then we're done and then we got two more months and then whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen nobody's gonna you know who knows right but yeah. it's gonna the election will be done this year will be done we're gonna be looking for a vaccine and we're gonna be starting some sort of movement towards sure normalcy being normal again right yeah. normalcy and um uh i really do feel like this year has been for me to sit quietly with a pen and paper and create and that's what i've been doing with my days rather than listening to a lot of stuff things to do is to put on uh even though i hate uh, spotify and streaming for what they're doing through musicians financially what i uh, do like about it is setting a radio station up so like lettuce for example one of my favorite funk bands right i'll put lettuce on and then i'll just say start radio and then all this new music starts flowing into me and what i like i start and i don't look at it now i look at it later oh, i like that because i don't want to i'm not in the mood to go chasing music right now but yeah. when a something comes on that's really great, I just start and I let it go. So yeah. I am listening to new music and I have new artists in my bullpen, but I don't know who they are yet. Yeah, you're indexing it for when you're right. Gonna, when I right, and when I start digging again and the and I start to see like 
people walking around without masks and it's like it starts to be like like people again yeah. right and but i'm a i'm a firm believer in wear your mask wear your mask um i it's i i have all that new, new music and those new artists are waiting for me next year yeah that's cool i've gotten into a couple of new things um that are not just new but the styles are somewhat new to me um one of them is a band called haken and i had the drummer on uh, which was great. And Haken is like a progressive metal band, which was never yeah. really no. my yeah. thing, but I found them by accident, just yeah. fell in love with them. And then another band that's like them, only more instrumental and more fusion-esque with these younger guys. In fact, the drummer Richie Martinez will be on with me on uh, the 27th. The band is called Arch Echo. And they're... I, I, I know, I'm friends with him on uh, social. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Hello, guys. so... Good. That's really great. They're yeah. so good. It reminds me of when I was like 12 or 13, <laughs> and I heard Return of Forever for the first time, Romantic Warrior, and my brain said, wait a minute, you mean it's okay to do that? Like, I realized that the boundaries I had been listening to weren't like Iron Curtain boundaries. This is far, you could basically do what the F you want. And these guys are kind of refreshing that in me with, to, in 2020, for young guys to be producing that sort of music, especially all instrumental, mm -hmm. is fascinating to me. And they're yeah. doing a great job. It's really neat. I love it. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you should bring that. You know, it's funny the, the whole listening thing is, uh, you know, I talked to Peter Erskine about this actually once. And the whole idea of listening is like, it's like, what new music are you listening? What new music? And, I, you know, it's funny. You get, I was actually thinking about this as I'm sitting there and I'm said I'm writing, doing a lot of writing. And my, my idea of, uh, wanting and thirsting for new input is based on me actually playing gigs, which I have not done. I haven't played a gig since March. Wow. It's absolutely, it's it's unbelievable. It's like, it's, I can't even believe I just said that. Yeah, it's a different I lifestyle. I, it's my life. Yeah. My life. My I've devoted my entire life to performing and playing music. Yeah. And I've never had this nine month hole in my life where there's been no gigs, you know, or anything. It's just like, it's, it's really weird. So I have been going actually, instead of wanting to hear new music, I've been going back to music and, and finding new depths of listening that I was talking to you about. Before. Yeah. And um, so, you know, if people are thinking like me, where they're kind of like a little bummed out about what's going on, I, my advice to those people is don't fight that. That's a normal, that is a normal right. action. Don't feel bad about yourself. You're not supposed to be running around all day trying to find new stuff all the time. You know, your thirst for new is often like everything else in a human life. It's not a linear climb. It goes in hills and valleys. Yeah. And when you're, in a, when you're on a hill and you're like, oh, man, I can't wait to discover something new, you're going to know it. Yeah. But if you're like me right now where it's just like I'm kind of like just I'm in like in a beautiful self-imposed just pause right now. Yeah. And I'm going backwards and listening. It's a completely fine thing, and I feel a lot of people. I'm getting a lot of emails lately about people who are they're full of angst, they're full of like putting pressure on themselves. Like, yeah, I feel, it like, I'm, need so, I feel like, like I'm supposed to. I feel like I'm supposed to. I feel like I'm. They keep saying this. I feel like I'm supposed to. And I'm saying, I'm not gonna. And I'm not engaging with that email. Yeah. Reframe it. I said, who's telling you this? Who's telling you that you're supposed to do this? Right. I said. I don't hear a drum oracle somewhere giving you, but I mean, these are all self-imposed. We're having yes. these, these, these weights put on us. Like, I feel like I'm supposed to, and you know, what's doing that to us? Social media. Yeah. Social media is doing that to us. You see somebody with a picture, you see somebody with a thing, you see them, they're, they're showing their best life. Oh, look what I've done. Look what I did. Right. It's all coming and you're reading the comments of like, well, I, I spent nine hours on Spotify today, finding new music. Right? What have you done? You know, and it's bullshit. Yeah. All of it is bullshit. Don't, don't, don't let those weights get you down ever. Yeah, I don't agree. Yeah. A yeah. thousand percent. Thanks for that. That's so valuable. I really appreciate that information. I know yeah. Everybody, everybody says, says everybody has to be really kind to themselves right now. Yeah. Everybody's that's where it be, starts. Absolutely. Yeah, you got to be kind to yourself. We're going through something that's, you know, it's, there's even if you're aware of it or not. You know, some people are like, "Oh, it doesn't affect me." I'm like, Ugh. "Yes, it does." 
Yeah. If it affects the world, it affects you. Yeah. If it affects yeah. someone you know, it affects you. We are not, we're not cats, we're dogs. We are right. pack animals, all right? We don't live solitary lives. Everything affects everyone else. Even right. if you're on social media and somebody's saying something, believe it, you can't just say, oh, I didn't see that. Everything affects you. Yeah. Everything does. You're a part of your environment. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. We'll definitely be doing this again. And folks, if you yeah. missed it, Tommy and Rob Wallace of Hudson Music and myself will be making an announcement in the next few weeks about a really cool Groove Essentials cool. That's right. yeah. contest. It's going to be fun. So watch for that. But my last question for today is the Tommy I Go Fun Fact question, which uh -oh. is when you're not doing anything related to music whatsoever and i know water seeks its own level so you, you do that a lot what is it that you like to do what other interests you so nothing it's something that has nothing to do with music right yes okay correct uh i have uh two things i have two things, have two things. remember it's a family show keep it cool <laughs> everybody hide <laughs> Famous Captain. Everybody knows Captain. If you do the challenge, oh, it's beautiful. There he is. Nice. Hi, Hi baby. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> That's my buddy right there. Here, where'd you go? Come on, sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Awesome. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. There you go. Good boy. There he is. Everybody wants to know where Captain is. Hi, oh, Captain. Hi. How old is he? <laughs> He's four. Nice. Four. Nice and yeah, young still. Four. Yeah, he is a good boy. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we go out when we when we run and we hike and we do stuff together and he's just the best guy in the world. He he reminds me every day of how to live life correctly. Great. You know, this is the so guy. Great. Great. Nothing nothing gets him down. He's all love all the time. Yeah. He's all forgiveness all the time. All he doesn't he doesn't want anything. He doesn't need anything. He's just got, you know, it uh, isn't worried about yesterday. That's you know, great. Beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, and so the that's thing the one thing. What's the what's the other thing? The other thing is that my main hobby is cooking. Oh um, wow, we gotta talk about. I had a cooking show on TV years ago. Get the hell out! Yeah, I, in the early two okay. thousands. That's how I fell in love with video. Yeah, we'll have to talk. So, what's your favorite thing to cook? Uh, well, a favorite thing is uh, well, my favorite cuisine. You know, I studied at uh, at uh, Institute of Culinary Arts, and uh, you know, I mostly study, do French and Italian based okay. stuff, but. Um, I just, uh, because of health stuff and uh, getting older, I just bought my first paleo book. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you know, so I got to get away from the pasta. And yeah. All that. Well, I was. Uh, but I'm like, I still like, I'm like, I love food, like overall. So I just got yeah. my friend to dip my hand into the, uh, the paleo stuff. We will you know? definitely have to talk more about this on the next interview. A year ago, July, I was diagnosed with extremely advanced diabetes. Oh, no. Big surprise out of nowhere. Out of nowhere? Yeah, I've never been overweight. I had some weird things going on, like my vision and all that, but mm -hmm. it was a huge surprise, big surprise. It doesn't run in my family, so I've had to make some major changes, and I am fine with it. When the okay. doctor said, had this gone undetected, and, and you kept doing what you were doing, which I was eating okay for normal people, but he said you would have had kidney failure, gone blind, or died within two to four years. He said, just tell me what to do. Tell me what to do, but I don't take insulin. I don't take medication. It's all been with diet and exercise. We'll have to continue this again this great, real soon. Great diet and exercise is where it's at. Yeah, I had uh, my uh, I had um, high blood pressure and oh, uh, which does run in my family. My dad had it. He started taking medication when he was in his when he was in his thirties. Had took it for the rest of his life. I had it. I, I had a high reading, and my doctor put me on medication. I hated it. I knock it down to 120 oh, that's awesome. exercise. Good. well let's do this we're going to go so we can fit this on instagram when it's done okay we'll, we'll start our next interview talking about diet and exercise as musicians and how especially as drummers very and most important. Athletic very, musicians, very very important right. yeah, yeah how to get that together tommy thank you so much for coming on the show for the first time really appreciate it and thank you everybody around the world for joining tommy Iko and myself dan shinder here on drum talk tv be kind to yourself be kind to each other. Be kind to each other. Otherwise, what kind of behavior is that? <laughs> Thanks, Tommy. Hang on the line with me. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.